your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name, I will lift up my hands. Good morning, Living Hope. Welcome. We've come to worship our Savior. We've come to lift his name high, to speak his word, to worship him, to pray. Today is the day to worship. We love you, Lord. Father in heaven, we come this morning to bless your name, to offer our sacrifice of praise. Father, I pray that today you are blessed and glorified. I pray that your name is lifted high and that your will is done in your people. Please, Father, hear our prayers today. Receive our offering of worship. Be in your spoken word. Let those who do not know you come saying, what must I do to be saved? to be part of the kingdom. We pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Isaiah 37, 16. O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of earth. You have made heaven and earth. Amen. On any mortal man, you are not a God in need of anything we can give by your plan. That's just the way it is. You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent. Mortal man, you are not a God in need of anything we can give by your plan. That's just the way it is. You are God alone from before time began. You were. Of everything we can give, you are God, and that's just the way it is. You are God alone from before time began. You were on your throne. You are God alone, and right now in the good time. Let's start. 
John 15, verses 9 and 10. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. John 14, 21, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. 
and he who loves me will be loved by my father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Verses 4 and 5. For your steadfast love is great above the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. I sing this praise to you alone And once again I worship at your throne I lift you up, you cover me Safe and strong Sheltered by your wings, I gaze upon your glory now. Redeeming love satisfies my soul. You summon angels all This joy of salvation I have found. I exalt you. I will come with shouts of joy into your presence. Faithful God, my heart is open. Overwhelmed by you in spirit and in truth, I stand to worship you 
with all I am, I am yours, Lord, I am yours, Lord, Jesus, my heart is I gaze upon your glory now, redeeming love satisfies my soul. You saw many angels all around, this joy of salvation I have found. with shouts of joy into your presence faithful God my heart is overwhelmed by you in spirit and in truth I stand With all I am, I am yours, Lord. I am yours, Lord. Jesus, my heart is overwhelmed. Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, our hearts are overwhelmed. We give you praise because you alone deserve the praise. We gaze upon the glory that you've show, shed down upon us. We love you, Lord. We give you praise and glory. We lift you up because no one is worthy but you. And as I heard someone say, it's not because we don't have other gods that we could worship but it's because you are the true God. So we lift you high. We worship you. We bow down to you. We love you, Father. I pray your blessing over all who are listening today. I pray your blessing over their families. I pray your blessing over this country, God. Please, Lord, bring us to a place of healing, spiritual healing. Bring us back to you. Turn us back, God. We have lost our way. Help us to find our way back we might be in your grace in your blessing we love you father we praise your name may you be glorified today in the name of your son jesus christ amen oh jesus my heart is overwhelmed what a beautiful expression of love to god thank you miss peggy for your worship singing for us this morning god bless you i hope you enjoyed the worship you participated in as she sang, the Lord is worthy of praise. Amen. He's the one we want to honor, and we love him this morning. Praise God. I'm glad you're here. Thank you again for liking and subscribing and sharing these things. That You're literally sending the word of God all over the world by just a click or two. And I just want to say thanks again for your participation in this ministry. This morning we find ourselves once again in Galatians chapter 2. This is a fascinating book. Galatians is, is a book that's 
that is reflective of the fact that Paul is upset. Um, people have been coming in trying to pervert the gospel. And in perverting the gospel, they're changing the message. They're distorting it. Paul's been responding very strongly. And as you may remember, Paul has just encountered another problem. And that is one of the pillars of the faith. Peter himself has come to Antioch to visit the Christians. He was hanging out with the Gentiles and enjoying fellowship with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ until the Jewish leadership showed up from Jerusalem. And then Peter found himself wanting to separate himself from the Gentile believers. If you remember, Paul directly confronts him. Uh, and that's where we're going to start today. But before we get there, I want to do two things. I want to give you a couple of announcements, and then I want to pray for us before we begin. So let's get to the announcements first, and then we'll go from there. Let's see. The first announcement is this. On the first Wednesday night when we have our Wednesday night Bible study, It'll be 7 o'clock here, Denver time. Um, we're taking questions and answers on that Wednesday night. So that'll be the Wednesday coming up here in a few days. If you want to submit a question, uh, please do so. Just email it to Pastor Scott at welcometolivinghope.com. Or you can even ask a question live during the session on that Wednesday night. In either case, we welcome your question and we'll do our best to give you a biblical answer. And the second thing I want to point out is another resource. It's, it's found at ruadisciple.com. You'll see all video resources here. Uh, you can click on that or you can go up and click on the Lessons tab. If you click on the Lessons tab, you'll see all the lessons listed by books of the Bible. Click on any one of those and it'll take you to a page that has all the passages and the lessons associated with them. If you click on the lesson itself, the title, you'll be taken to the YouTube page that has the lesson on it. And then if you click on the passage, you'll be taken to the biblical reference right there where you can read it for yourself. It's a great resource for you. Um, I think we're approaching, I think we're over 700 now, uh, video lessons for you, whether they are uh, sermons or Living Hope Today's, uh, the devotionals, or maybe just a minute. There, uh, there's a, a bunch of resources available to you. You know, the Bible says that we are called to make disciples. Perhaps you don't know where to take somebody in the Bible to help them become a disciple. But if you're going to make disciples as Jesus commands you as a follower of Christ, maybe you could take them to one of these videos and you guys could both watch it and talk about it and try to grow in your knowledge of Scripture that way. It's a resource for you. I hope it's of benefit. But I wanted to make sure you knew about it. Again, ruadisciple.com. Let me pray for us as we prepare our hearts to look into the book this morning. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the book of Galatians. I thank you for your purpose in this book. Lord, you want us to know what you've commanded and obey what you've commanded. Help us understand what we're learning today. And not just to know it, God, but to change our thinking, change our motivation, change our thought process in the, in the discovery of your truth, and mostly change our behavior that we might live in a way that pleases you. I just pray for every one of us watching today that you'd open our eyes to the truth, help us understand, and give us the courage to live right. And Lord, if there is someone watching this that doesn't know you, I pray by your mercy that you bring them into saving relationship with Jesus Christ even this day. Draw them to yourself. I pray in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Okay, wonderful. Well, let's get to Galatians. I, I want to just remind you of Galatians 2.5. When Paul's talking about these guys that are perverting the message of the gospel, he says, To them we did not yield in submission even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And that's really what this is about. Paul wants the saving message of Jesus Christ to be preserved, not perverted, not distorted, but preserved authentically as Jesus has revealed it so that when we place our faith in the message, we will be saved because we are believing what God actually said and not believing a lie. That's his goal to preserve the gospel for us. 
All right, you remember when he talks about those guys that are distorting the gospel, he says, look, if anybody preaches a different gospel to you, let him be accursed or anathema or even damned would be a way to translate it. Paul gets very, very strong. But as I said, Peter shows up. Peter starts to separate himself when the Jewish circumcision party shows up because that is the distortion they're adding to the gospel. If you recall, they're saying, yeah, you're not really saved if you just have faith in Jesus Christ. You need to have faith and be circumcised. You need to add this work to your faith if you want to be acceptable to God. Well, again, Paul will have none of it. It gets very contentious. Paul confronts Peter to his face in public. And while that's happening, Paul says this, But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, again, there it is. He wants to preserve the message of the gospel. He wants to preserve the truth of the gospel. I said to Cephas, that's another name for Peter. That's the Aramaic name. I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? How can you start to require the Gentile believers uh, fulfill the requirements of Judaism? Paul is attacking the problem in Peter's behavior right here. And now he goes on to explain. He says, for we ourselves are Jews by birth. And Paul was a Jew. You remember, he used to be named Saul. In Acts chapter 9, Jesus knocks him down as he's on his way to Damascus to persecute more Christians. He's a Christian hater. He's doing everything he can to stop the growth of the church by persecuting believers. Jesus knocks him down, and Saul turns into Paul. Saul realizes that Jesus is alive, that he is the Christ, that he is the Messiah, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And instead of Saul, the murderous hater of Christians, God transforms him into Paul, the lover of Jesus Christ and the lover of all who will serve the Lord by faith, the defender of the gospel, the proclaimer of the gospel. But he knows all about rule keeping in Judaism. It's what he used to do. We ourselves are Jews by birth. We're not Gentile sinners. That's just a phrase they used to use to identify Gentiles. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law. Now, this is so critically important. And it's something you and I really have to focus on here because many times people try to earn their salvation. We've been talking about it for the last couple of weeks. They try to be good enough for God in their behavior. Paul says, look, keep all the rules you want. A person is not justified by works of the law. That is not how God has proclaimed salvation to be. You might think it should be that way, or some rule-keeping, ritualistic, religious person might think that's how it should be. But you and I are looking for the truth of the gospel. We want to follow God according to what he has said. And here is what he says. You're not going to be justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Do you see that in the middle? It's through us believing that Jesus is the Christ that we are justified. What does it mean to be justified? Let's just go over that again for a second. Justification is a work God does in our hearts, not because we've kept all the rules, but because his son died for us. Why is that important? Because when Jesus died for us, he took our penalty upon himself. And when it says we're justified, it means we're saved from the penalty of sin. What is the penalty of sin? Death, an eternal separation from God. We're saved from the penalty of sin. We're justified because Jesus paid the price. He paid the penalty for our sin by being crucified, by dying as the sacrificial lamb of God on our behalf. So that when we come to him by faith, he takes our punishment upon himself. He puts his righteousness on us. We are saved from the penalty of sin. It's called justification. It's a beautiful truth. 
We're not justified by the works of the law. We're justified through faith in Jesus Christ. And so he says, so we also have believed in Christ Jesus. Why did we do that? Well, because that's how salvation works. That's what God has decreed. That's how he has planned it. That's what he wants. So we have also believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ. That's the process God has declared. And not by works of the law. We're not justified by keeping rules. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. I don't know, you know there's a lot of people out there that say, Oh, Scripture is so confusing. I just don't get it. I mean, there's not much confusion here, is there? Are you confused by works of the law? No one will be justified. You can't be made right with God through trying to earn your way to heaven by doing good works. That's not very hard to understand. And yet, so many times I meet people that, you know, they're all about doing good deeds, trying to be a good person, trying to earn God's favor. When God says, look, my son's death is the only way to pay for the evil in your heart and in your behavior. My son's death is the only acceptable thing to me, is what God is saying. Do all the good works that you want. You can't unscramble the egg of your evil, sinful nature. You sin against me all the time. You can't just undo that by trying to do better. No. Only death will bring about forgiveness. And the sacrifice has already been offered when the Lamb of God, Jesus himself, dies on the cross on our behalf. That's the gospel message. So Paul here is telling them, look, you can't be justified by works of the law. It doesn't matter. The cross is enough. You don't need to add circumcision to the mix. You don't need to add some other kind of work or ritual to the mix. You can't be justified by works of the law. So for all those religions that say, oh, we need to pray five times a day. We need to walk counterclockwise around a cube in Mecca. We need to wash in the Ganges River. We need to live self-actualized lives and, and serve our own purpose and be happy. I mean, there is no salvation in any religion that tries to earn its favor with God. There is no salvation there. You cannot be justified before God like that. It's only through believing in Jesus Christ. That's why he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Why is it so exclusive? Because Jesus is the only one that mitigates the wrath of God. But more on that later. Let's just review this for a second. So salvation, it's not about heritage. The Jews can't say, well, I have Abraham's blood in my veins, so God obviously likes me best. It's not about heritage. No, salvation is offered to all who will believe. Salvation is not obtained by keeping the law. That's something we've said over and over already. But it is obtained through faith in Jesus Christ. That's how salvation comes. Justification, we're saved from the penalty of sin. It is obtained through faith in Jesus. Only through faith in Jesus. It's only he that has the power to save us. Nothing else and nothing we can add to the cross. It's only the Lord himself. Very critical for us to decide or to believe. Look what it says here in Romans 3.20. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. The law... Keeping the rules has never been enough to save us, to undo the sin that we have committed before God. No, the law does what? Look at the bottom. Through the law comes knowledge of sin. In other words, when it says don't steal, well then guess what? <laughs> when you steal, you understand that you've broken the law. If you didn't have a law that told you not to steal, then you could steal without that guilty conscience because you wouldn't have that feeling that you just did something wrong. You know how it works. You see the speed limit sign is 35, and 
you know you're going 40, but then you see that police officer, what do you do? You immediately slow down. Why? Because you know you're breaking the law. That sign tells you what the law is, and you understand you're going too fast when you see that officer. Otherwise, you might just keep speeding, right? I mean, that's how we operate in our sinful natures. Romans 3.20, For by the works of the law, no one will be justified. So let's go back to Galatians. But if, in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, okay, <laughs> notice how this is said, church, if in our endeavor, like if we were working to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners. Is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. Jesus Christ is not a servant of sin, no. And we are, we are going to be found to be sinners, all of us. But we cannot supply effort to bring our salvation about. It's not by works. As Paul goes on, he says, For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. If I try to go back and say, I want to be saved by works. I want to add circumcision to God's salvation plan. I want to put my own criteria on God's salvation plan. Even if God doesn't have that criteria, I'm going to add it because I want to rebuild what I tore down. <laughs> Paul says, look, I, I'm just being a transgressor if I do that. God has made his way of salvation absolutely clear. He has revealed it in his word. Our job isn't to rewrite it or go before God to tell him what we think he should do. Our job is to follow what he said. And, and he said that we're justified through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the way God reveals salvation. For through the law, I died to the law. In other words, <laughs> my inability to keep the law showed me I was going to come before God as a guilty person. I died to the law so that I might live to God, so that I might be his. Look at this. This is one of the most influential verses in the New Testament, if you ask me. Paul really now is going to explain the dynamics of what it means to live your life having been born again. And here it is. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Now, now just think about this before we go on. Uh, Paul, what are you saying? You know, how can you say you no longer live when you're standing here in front of us or when you're writing this letter? How, how can you say you're not alive? He's not talking about physical life, is he? He's talking about spiritual life. Spiritually speaking, he's been crucified with Christ. Spiritually speaking, he no longer lives for himself. No. But, he, but Christ, who lives in me, that's who he lives for now. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. He died for me. I don't have to offer anything else because he's offered everything in giving his own life for me. Now, we're going to break this verse down for a minute because this is just too, too important. You don't want to miss this. I have been crucified with Christ. Just think about this. In Romans 6, we read this. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. We, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. In Romans 6, what are we told? We're told that we died. We were buried with him. Did you understand that when you received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you were dying to yourself? You were no longer in a position to live life to get all you wanted to get out of it. Instead, you are to live life now in Christ to serve his purpose. He wants us to walk in newness of life. And the passage goes on, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. 
That's the payoff for all those who sacrifice now to know him. We have eternity with him. We'll be raised with him. We'll live forever with him. It's a beautiful, beautiful truth that gets us through any hard circumstance this life might throw at us. And listen, we know that our old self, that's our old spiritual self, was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. There you see it at the end of verse 6. Do you see that? The reason we die to ourselves is because we no longer are slaves to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Again, there's the real point. We die to ourselves. I have been crucified with Christ, Paul says. And what's he talking about? He's talking about exactly what he wrote to the Roman church here. He's died to himself. Christ now lives in him. There's been a transformation. This is why the Bible declares so clearly that we are new creations. The old has passed away. The new has come. We have died to ourselves. That's a critical distinction for you to think about in your own heart. You know, the world keeps pushing us to get our bucket lists all checked off and live the best life now and do everything we can do now and The Bible says, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's not really about you. I know you live in a self-centered generation, but it's not really about you. The Lord says to us, it's about me. You're dying to yourself to follow me. That's what Jesus told us, right? Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. And here we see it explained. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Paul is saying, look, I've died to that sinful nature. I've died to that old way of rule-keeping in my life. I am here to serve Jesus Christ, him alone. He goes on, he says, look, I no longer live. Now we know he means that metaphorically he's writing this down. He's still physically alive at this point. But the point is still the truth. He no longer lives. If you go to the book of Colossians, you'll read this. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. In other words, your spiritual life, you're living for your self-sufficient pleasure, your, your own way, walking in error. That's gone. You're dead to that now. You're now in Christ. This is what Paul is pointing us to when he says, I no longer live. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then also will appear, you also will appear with him in glory. This is our hope. We give our lives up now knowing that we will, we will spend eternity with the living Lord Jesus and have life abundantly with him. We're going to be there. This is why we no longer live. And he says, look, this ought to manifest itself in the way you live. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. There has to be a transformation of behavior to validate the transformation of heart. We've got to be a people that walk with him in obedience. If you love me, you will keep my commands. That's what Jesus tells us a lot. So Paul says, look, I am crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ who lives in me. Now he's talking about the transformation. Christ lives in me now. But God, in Ephesians 2, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. What a fabulous, what a fabulous truth. He he is living in us now, and we have been saved. Look at this, it even goes on. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Notice verse 6, it's in the past tense. He's telling us that as far as God 
is concerned as he looks at us, this transformation has already happened. We are in Christ. We are covered with his righteousness. We are now alive in him. He has made us truly alive. Not just physically the heart is pumping, but spiritually the soul has been regenerated through the grace of God. He's raised us up. We were dead in our trespasses, but he made us alive. Praise God. And as Paul continues in Galatians 2.20, he says, Now Christ lives in me. I just want you to read this in John 14 with me. Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. There it is. We, we talk about it at the Living Hope Today devotional every now and then. Jesus ties our love for the Lord to our obedience. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Okay. And my Father will love him. Fantastic. And we will come to him and make our home with him. Here Paul is telling us, look, I'm crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Here's exactly what John 14, 23 is telling us. As we obey the Lord and walk with him, he comes and makes his home with us. The Father, the Son, the Spirit of God indwell us. Wow, what a fabulous truth that is. Isn't it, church, just to think about? The Lord himself lives in us. You know what that means? He goes with us wherever we go. You know what that means? We need to think about where we're taking God. Does he really want to go to the places we go? Are we really honoring him by doing the things we do? We need to check ourselves and ask the Lord for strength to avoid temptation and avoid sin, that we wouldn't dishonor the Lord we love with our behavior. We've got to really pay attention because we see that he makes his home with us. I'm crucified with Christ, but I no longer live. It's Christ who lives in me. And then Paul says, in the life I now live in the flesh... I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I am telling you guys, I am totally transformed through knowing Jesus Christ. I have been completely changed. I used to hate Christians. I used to kill Christians. I used to be anti-Christ. But now, Christ lives in me. He's totally transformed me. And instead of living in all that hatred and self-righteousness I used to live in, now I live by faith in the Son of God. Why? Because he loves me. How did he show he loved me? He gave himself for me. This is why Paul gives all he has to the Lord. And I just remind you of Luke 14. So therefore, this is Jesus speaking, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Jesus demands total commitment. Paul has clearly made total commitment. He is dead to himself. He he lives now because Christ lives in him, and he lives by faith in the Son of God. Can you say the same? You know, in modern American Christianity, we have this thing where we, we want to go to heaven, but we want to live our own way until we get there. God will have none of that. And Paul's expressing to us here in Galatians 2.20 the transformation that God makes available to all of us if we will humble ourselves and submit to the transformation. We can live by faith now. Jesus says, what? If you don't want to renounce everything you have to follow me, you can't follow me. Jesus demands total commitment. So let's go on in Luke, I'm sorry, Galatians 2, just to finish our passage this morning. Look at verse 21. I do not nullify the grace of God. A critical thing to say here in Paul's writing. Why is it critical? Because Paul has just told us how this new life works, how this walking in Christ works, and he is at peace. He knows the Savior. He has joy in his heart. He's been forgiven. He's been filled with the Spirit. He's walking by the Spirit of truth's guidance and direction. God's going to use him to write half the New Testament, or about half. In the end, 
He says, I'm not going to nullify the grace of God. God has shown me unmerited favor by allowing Jesus to die for me. I'm not going to try to change that and nullify that and massage that around to where that's something that I need to add my own good works to it. Are you guys crazy? The cross is sufficient. It's all we need. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. If I could be right by doing good things and keeping the rules, then why did Jesus have to die if that was a possibility? Well, none of us will ever keep the law perfectly. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. We've sinned. What does that mean for us? It means we are hopelessly lost until Christ dies on the cross and we put our faith in him. We will never be justified without that. I just want you to think about this. Look at this last line. Then Christ died for no purpose. You see this here? He died for no purpose. If we try to save ourselves through good works or keeping the rules of religion. Have you ever thought about what Jesus saved you from? I think it's really incredible to think about it right here because when he tells us Christ died for no purpose, we can think about what was the purpose that Jesus died. Why did he have to die? I mean, you know, remember when you used to play hide and seek, if you couldn't find somebody, you you said something like, well, everybody come free because you couldn't find him and okay, the game's over, don't worry about it. Why can't God look at sin like that? When we sin against him, why can't God say, ah, never mind, it's okay. Well, God is a just God, and every sin has to be punished. Boy, that's a load of truth, isn't it? Every sin has to be punished. So either I pay for my own sin when I meet God on Judgment Day, or I put my faith in the Savior, and he pays for my sin. If I think I can come to God with some sort of message to God, gee, God, I lived a healthy, happy life. I I checked off my whole bucket list, and I made a lot of money and took a lot of nice vacations and went to a lot of great parties. Uh, God, you see me as a good person, right? You're going to let me in, right? In the end, we're not justified that way. Living for ourselves never brings justification We have to bring ourselves into humble submission before the Savior to believe in him, to ask him into our lives, and to change our behavior to obey him. Look at these passages with me. In Romans 5, 9, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood. Okay, we have been saved from the penalty of sin through the death of Jesus. Much more shall we be saved by him, from the wrath of God. Look at that line in yellow. God uses the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross to save us from God. Not to save us from a hard life, not to save us from our mistakes or our addictions, not not to save us from our bad choices. God uses the death of Jesus on the cross to save us from God. We know for a fact, according to Scripture, that God is going to wipe out evil, decimate evil. We know that to be a fact. Okay, <laughs> that's really great, except we're evil, right? We sin against God. If, if God's going to wipe out evil and we're evil, what are we going to do? How are we going to compensate for that? There is nothing we can do. The only thing we can do is throw ourselves at the foot of the cross and ask the Lord Jesus to enter our lives and to serve him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength for all the days he gives us. That's what we can do to believe and to walk with him. And when that happens, we're saved from the wrath of God. Just to bring it to you one more time, 1 Thessalonians 1.10, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. We escape God's judgment against evil because we are covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that has happened because God has drawn us to himself and allowed us 
to put our faith in him. What a glorious truth we're confronted with here. How wonderful it is to know that the Lord himself loves us enough to save us. The question for us today is, am I living my life like I'm crucified with Christ? Am I living my life where I could honestly say, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me? If we're, if we're uncomfortable saying that, if we don't really believe that to be true about ourselves, we need to ask ourselves whether we're really walking with Christ or not. Because we have died with Christ if we are authentically his. Anything else means we're not saved, means we're going to experience God's wrath against sin. We have to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith alone. By faith alone. Well, church, I'm so happy you're here for this today. I hope you learned something, and I hope your faith is strengthened through it. If you have questions or comments, please leave them in the comment section below. And again, remember, if you do want to support this church, you can pray for the people of Living Hope Community Church that we might obey God in every way. You might also want to donate financially to the church if you want to support us that way. There's a link in the description below. Um, and by mail, there's an address below if you want to send a check by mail instead of donating, ele donating electronically. In any case, just get the main point today. We are not saved by our works. We are only saved through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We put our faith in him. He saves us. I pray God blesses your church. Serve him well. Lord, we give you glory.